it's lovely to be back in Michael Hartnett country, albeit virtually. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this year's festival. Um, uh, the first poem I'm going to read is uh, a poem which is in my daughter's voice. Um, and it's my daughter's voice when she was about six. Uh, we were sitting um, driving somewhere and uh, she suddenly started to tell me my life as she had you know, gathered bits and pieces together from family conversation. And her telling of my life was, was so funny and so exuberant and so quirky that I decided to steal her voice and keep going with the narrative. So this is my life according to you. So I was born and was small for ages and then suddenly a cardboard box appeared with two furry black ears sticking out of it. It made me nervous but I was brave and gave it a bell to play with and then out it jumped and loved me. It was my cat. I called it Morris Morrissey. It matched my mother's Morris Minor. For the next bit, I was a teenager and then I grew up. I had a flat in Dublin and a boyfriend. He was a vet. Little bed, little kitchen, little tower rack, lots of little cups and saucers. And then off he went to Africa. He sent me pictures of giraffes and of the second tallest waterfall in the world. When he got back, he wasn't my friend anymore. I cried for a week. I was also at university, a bigger place than school with bigger chairs and desks. And when it finished, I found a suitcase it was red with purple flowers. It had a scarf around the handle. I put in everything I needed, socks and a jotter and snacks, and took a plane across the ocean to, go to Japan to visit Godzilla, where it was summer and boiling hot, and the people all kept wind chimes to make it cooler and rode bicycles to the shops, and at the same time held up umbrellas, though it wasn't even raining. And when I met a man in a bright white classroom, the darkest parts of our eyes turned into swirls then question marks then hearts so we got married and went hippity hoppity splat a mountain a lake a desert we bought a house a tiny one at first and then a massive one a baby knocked at the door one night but didn't come in and then another baby came he cried a lot we thought he had a tummy ache we gave him a bath in a bucket he was just lonely for his sister to come and keep him company but you were still floating about in space inside your bubble egg it had accessories a switch for going sideways, a switch for going upside down or faster. It was a cross between a sparkly green and a sparkly silver. The moon was very annoying. And then whenever we'd all been bored on our own for long enough, down you came on a path of lightning to finish off the family. You were born on the living room floor at three in the morning in front of the trampoline sofa. And I heard them say, a girl, and set up straight away. We were both pretty and I opened out my arms and that's it really when you grow up I'm going to be so busy taking you to the house shop waiting by the playground gates to bring your children swimming I won't be any different I'll keep your room exactly as it is for you to visit bric-a-brac collection on the shelf the bed your father built the letters of your name in neon appearing on the ceiling when it's time. Uh, and this is a poem about a nativity play in a primary school. Uh, so very small children, um, four, four year olds, uh, maybe five, but, but lots of very small children um, enacting the story of Christmas. Nativity. The assembly hall is full though it's early still. Mums and dads on loan from their workaday offices. Littler brothers and sisters crashed out in pushchairs and parked along the aisle like excess baggage. Chat rises up to perch among the rafters and gets steadily amplified, making the walls resound. Stew tea in too thin plastic scalds our hands. And then it's dark and started. The principal stands, reminds us of the exits. He occupies his moment so deliberately he might be chairing Congress. 
and a decree went out. And all the boys and girls, that all the world and several weeks rehearsals should be taxed. And thanks to those who helped with sewing, and thanks to those who witnessed in their houses that a child was born this day, and thanks to everyone for turning up and time to welcome the fixed, astonishing star over Bethlehem and all the other stars, and please applause. We turn as heliotropes to the sun to watch a hundred preternaturally tiny children follow their teachers in and almost fail to recognise our sons and daughters amongst them. So cleanly have they been lifted from their context, so splendidly have they been managing without us. The chorus is dressed in red and green, the animals in animal costumes, ten of them wear wings. And here come the key anointed individuals, the virgin, the husband, the keeper, the soldier. They of transitive voices, survivors of many tests like Odysseus whose reward is a human name and bar the two dear faces in the distance, backlit with adoration, a room of strangers staring at them. Narrators rise and fall to call the action points. The songs break in as ponderous punctuation and are exhausting for everyone. We half expect the children to unhook themselves from the strings of their teacher's attention and to cry or laugh, to scatter like birds off a lake. But they don't. Not now, not yet. And we are left with a row of just licked by a cow looking boys in dressing gowns, Mary in a dress, Emmanuel in his cradle, low-key and ineffable, a portent pointing the star of herself in two directions at once, and this studded arena we've led them to, these people whom we've forged, whose frankincense we breathed when they were born. And we're sorry, but we don't know how it happened or what the instructions are. We've left them in itchy knee socks, holding up a sign, or how it will end. And I'd like to read a poem about Greenland, um, about the way in which Greenland is, is no longer covered in snow and ice, particularly now during the summer months and the the pack ice has melted uh, now to allow passage um, to the northeastern corner of Greenland. Um, and this is inspired by a Danish documentary, Expedition to the End of the World, which um, put together various scientists and artists on a, um, on a sail ship, uh, so not a ship that used fossil fuels, to kind of explore this area and the, these these fjords. So each um, section of this poem is in the voice of, of one of the participants in the scientific expedition and it's called Whitelessness. The Geologist. The rocks on Greenland are the oldest on earth. This one's a fossilized algal mat. This one contains the ridges of human teeth. Some early Paleolithic adolescent caught grinning at the moments of death in a stone photograph. We manoeuvre them down to the beach on a stretcher. Ochres and greys and blacks ricochet back and forth across the massive, as denuded of white as the west of Ireland while the shed ice bobs in the bay, begging smaller and smaller comparisons. 
lozenges dissolving visibly on the tongue, droplets of fat on broth. If it's life that controls the geological machinery of the planet rather than the other way round, we are neither new nor tragic. This came to me one morning as I sorted out my cabin and the hundreds of marathon runners in my brain stopped and changed direction. The photographer. The world speaks to me through signs, tiny signs, missable signs. The stones in the river are speaking to me. How many decades has this ox skull lain here? It looks like a crime scene. A waterfall rises as mist off the face of the rock, missing its ending. The red earth holds up a rainbow on its outstretched hands. We sailed right to the edge of a glacier in a dinghy yesterday, pushed against it hard, but it didn't budge or squeal. It was the colour of desert turquoise and implacable. When we got back, I made a map of my life with holes for hideouts between birth and death and showed it to my friend. In the beginning, God put a rainbow in the sky as a promise that he'd never let the ocean rise again. The geographer. Ica Opmalt, says the map unexplored. What's this valley called? What would you like to call it? For the first few days we practice with rifles on the pebbly beach, though it's hardly dangerous. Polar bears are visible for miles against the darker hillsides. Bog cotton nods in swathes above the permafrost. Lars and Simon buzz about the sky in their aerial dinghy, taking aerial photographs while we concentrate on drilling up the planet's small intestine and seeing what it's eaten. Ridiculously overdressed, two muskoks trundle past. We must sound enormous. Where before there were only kittiwakes, the occasional seaward explosion of an iceberg disintegrating. But they blank us, nevertheless. The artist. I packed anthrax, megadeth, metallica. I packed two dozen sketch pads and 16 boxes of pencils. Shell's Arctic exploratory outriders in their magenta life jackets can kiss my shiny metal ass. I did not pack colours. Our foremast resembles a crucifix. I stuck my boot on the skull of an ox as though I'd shot it and smiled at the camera. Running on our way hiding, you will pay dying 1,000 deaths. I straddle the prow of the ship to sketch whatever it is I'm looking at and the daylight lasts and lasts. For all the white animals, the hares, the foxes, the wolves, I just leave spaces on the paper where their bodies were last time I looked up. The rest I filibuster in in grey or black to stop the quiet. The marine biologist. Fuck everything, become a pirate, declares my t-shirt. But I don't mean it. Ocean invertebrates are inconceivably lovely. Each morning, I lower a bucket over the side of the ship, clank it back up on deck, then stick my hand inside the sea's feely bag. In countless numbers, the fjord system's summer whales perform their languid acrobatics within metres of the bowsprit. Transfer even a soupçon of meltwater to a petri dish and hush. The world's most 
previously inaccessible ballet dancers are practicing arabesques. Such secretly parted curtains. Last Friday, I identified an entirely new species of annelid, a male and a female framed and translucid under the microscope's hood. They appeared to be having sex. The archaeologist. Uncover a single nick on a flint made to sharpen it and you've nailed it. The paleo Eskimo village, which must have existed here where this nice is, hoves into view their big tent open to the sea, their stone age playground. Laughter, dogs, fire. Then nothing for 300,000 years and now me in my Ushanka. The fact was, he'd gone looking for his father. Lower down the coast, we stood on the deck of the ship and watched a polar bear attacking an outpost. Then we went to look. It had shredded the pages of a reader's digest. Before we got there, its long body had lolloped away over the rocks and even from a distance had kept on flashing back at us, like Morse.